Good morning, Myrtle Fillmore. Good morning, Stacy Mathis Ross. I know you. Uh, I know you, and I know this church very well. I have been watching you carefully. I've been praying with you every day. I hear your prayers for each other, for yourselves, and for the world. And you're doing wonderful work here. Charles and I are very happy. Wow, thank you. Well, you know, I had gone to see Reverend Molly a few months ago. And I went in for my office hours as the youth director. And it was one of those days that the news got to me. And I said, the world seems to be going crazy. It seems like it's just mad. And I wish I could sit down and talk with our co-founders, Myrtle and Charles Fillmore. And she said, well, let's make that happen. So, I'm sorry she's not here today. <laughs> I think maybe she's getting ready for the Super Bowl game. <laughs> but we're honored you're with us. And I have to say, you're, you were born August 6, 1845, so you're 166 years old, but you don't look a day over 60. <laughs> husband and I knew that, we taught that, we felt we really hadn't come into our, our full energy of living until we were in our 70th summer. So working as hard as I can to keep getting younger and younger, even while on the other side. <laughs> yes. Well, so I have some questions for you for our modern audience and how you would look at modern living, but I think first I want to talk about your healings, because that was really the cornerstone, the entire reason for all of us being here, and the union with it. So you were raised um, the youngest of nine children, and you actually come from a very strict Methodist belief system, and you were very sick most of your life with tuberculosis, and that left you weak many times. And um, although I know that your father, you were the favorite of your father, and he gave you your nickname, Myrtle. Your born name is Mary Carolyn Page. So he would get you up and get you to dance a little bit. But um, once again, when you were 30, you became seriously ill with both tuberculosis and malaria. And so they moved you from the cold Midwest to Texas for warmer weather. And you did heal a bit, and in fact, you opened up a small private school and you also met your husband, Charles Fillmore, there in a book club. When you were 41 years old, after you married Charles, and you moved to the Midwest, back to Missouri, in 1886, you attended a lecture by Dr. E.B. Weeks. And I'd like you to tell our audience a little bit about that lecture and what you heard. So uh, it's important to remember that they were desperate times for me that I had been told that I was dying. I felt that I was dying. I was 41 years old and I had a four-year-old and a two-year-old. I had a husband that was busy working in real estate and every day I was getting weaker and weaker. It was a friend, a dear friend, that told me about this lecture with Dr. Weeks. And Dr. Weeks was a seminary student in the seminary that was founded by Emma Curtis Hopkins, known to metaphysicians as the teacher's teacher. And so Charles took me to this lecture. The room was filled, and I was open and receptive to a miracle. It was either have my miracle or I would die. And so it was during the course of that lecture, I heard one line that pierced my soul, my heart, filled me with a whole new vision of who I was. And that line was, I am a child of God. 
I do not inherit sickness. And this was in total opposition to what I had been brought up to believe. My father, my earthly father, told me since I was a child that I was sick, that I was weak, and that I had to be very careful with all of my vital energies. And yet in a moment I knew that that was not the truth about me. I never heard another word of that talk. I received what I came for. And my life was never the same. No, it wasn't because then you spent two years in prayer and you completely healed yourself. Because then, in 1888, um, the doctors couldn't find tuberculosis at all. I mean, you were completely healed. And you wrote in one of the most popular articles in Unity Magazine, I went to all the life centers in my body and spoke words of truth to them. I did not become discouraged at their being slow to wake up, but kept right on, both silently and aloud, declaring the words of truth until the organs responded. And so my question is, how did you know that they were going to respond? How did you have that faith? and the conviction that that was going to happen. What kept you going? Because two years, especially I think for our modern audience that's used to everything very quickly happening, two years is a seemingly long time to have that faith. I was convinced. I was convinced that I was not sick and that I would never be sick again. And once the healing process started, there was no going back. You say two years. Remember, I was sick for 41 years. That's a long time. Two years, nothing. <laughs> the body was catching up with what the mind already knew. I was convinced, and that conviction created a whole new body within me. There was no thought of illness. There was no thought of weakness. There was only confidence. There was only strength. There was only moving ahead. And then there was only sharing that good news. <clears throat> I felt better when I heard that line, I am a child of God. I felt better. I didn't wait to feel better. I was better. Time had nothing to do with it. It's in an instant. <laughs> I understand that. There's no delay in <laughs>
can't be healing and worry. There can't be healing and anxiety. There is only healing and wholeness. And so we take that thought and we breathe in. We breathe in the life of God within us. And I breathe out and I let go. I breathe in confidence. to dissolve into the ethers. The Christ of my being, my perfection, my divine inheritance, I claim right here and right now. There's only one idea about me, and that is a divine idea, created in the image and the likeness of the Father, of spirit, of life divine. And so I allow that light of God to fill my head filling my thoughts with a blessed assurance of this presence within me. I am healed. This Christ-like divine fills my eyes and I see with the eyes of spirit. Light of Christ fills my ears, and I hear the divine music that fills the universe. My throat, filled with Christ light, speaks only words of truth. My heart, my lungs, my liver, pancreas, spleen, my kidneys, intestines, all the organs of reproduction filled with Christ's light, revitalized, renewed, born fresh, clean, whole. My bones are strong, and so my muscles. The crooked way is made strength. I am steady. I am strong. I am a child of God. All disease, all idea of disease, all illusion of disease now dissolves. It does not exist. I declare the truth. I embrace it. I know it. I believe it. I have faith. One faith. God faith. I am whole. And I move forward this day to meet my good in all areas of my life. It is done completely. It is done according to thy word, sweet spirit. It is done. And for this I say thank you again and again. Thank you for my healing. And so it is. It is. It is. And so I let it be. Together, amen. amen. And a bigger, 
So once again, you're on the cutting edge, right? The technology is good because we use it for good. We declare it to be good. We use it for its highest good. Yes. Excellent. So the other question I have, in our country right now, I'm feeling like there's a lot of this separateness, um, a sense of I'm right and you're wrong, or my way of doing things is better than your way of doing things. I know with our teens, a lot of times I remind them that even though we may not agree with another religion, um, that doesn't mean that unity is superior to that religion. And I, I start to see this in our society, you know, that my diet's better than yours, or my car's better than yours, or my football team is better than yours. <laughs> so what do you think? How can we get back to that idea of oneness again, when we're bombarded with these different messages of separateness and superiority? You know... This is nothing new. This was going on in the time of Jesus and before. There's nothing special about that. It's not a sign of the times. It's a sign of our thinking of separation. So if we look for separation, we will see separation. If we look for differences, we will find differences. This is a unity center. This is a unity church. There is no separation. There is only oneness. And we identify with it. We look for it. We seek, actively seek the ways we are connected. And where we sense a separation, we bring our prayer of wholeness. We do not believe in the appearance of difference. We believe in one mind, one heart, <coughs> one love, and one prayer. That is your work. That is our work. This is the work I have been doing on the other side since 1931. We have to stop feeling that we're better than or different than. Outer appearance changes. People are <coughs> the same. We all want to be prosperous. We all want to be healthy. We all want to be happy. We all want our children to thrive. That's the connection. That's the connection. That's what we teach. Absolutely. So that goes back to prayer work. It's always sitting in silence, right, Marla? Our thoughts are prayers, and we are always praying. Do you sing that song? We here? do. We sing that song here. Make your thought a prayer, and then let every word you speak be the prayer of your soul made manifest. Yes. 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 And so, since you've been um, spying on us, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> There's no spying in oneness. That's right. <laughs> I think our modern audience would probably like your take on our modern living. Because we have, you know, different clothes than you did, and different music, and different hairstyles, and just different ways of living and doing things. So if you give us your take on our modern lifestyle. Well, the only thing I sense is that you're so hurried. You're just in this rushing sense all the time. So my, my, my soul just tells me to remind you, be sure that you're slowing down for your prayers and your meditation. <coughs> your clothing is merely a, a decoration that you choose. 
Clothing will always change. I see the skirts go up and down and up and down and up and down. And up. <laughs> That's all right. The music is loud and soft and loud and soft. You listen to the music that fills your soul and that brings you joy. That brings you joy. Don't worry what other people are doing. What is that to do with you? It's a full-time job to mind your own store. <laughs> to pull the weeds from our own garden. I had to do that work every day of my life. Looking at the garden in my soul and pulling out the weeds of negative thoughts of judgment. Just watch yourself. That's full of work enough. Well, I want to end with this, the covenant that you and Charles wrote in 1892. Yes. You wrote, We, Charles Fillmore and Myrtle Fillmore, husband and wife, hereby dedicate ourselves, our time, our money, all we have and all we expect to have to the spirit of truth and through it to the society of silent unity. It being understood and agreed that the said spirit of truth shall render unto us an equivalent for this dedication in peace of mind, health of body, yes. wisdom, understanding, love, life, and an abundant supply of all things necessary to meet every want without our making any of these things the object of our existence. In the presence of the conscious mind of Christ Jesus, this 7th day of December, A.D. 1892, Charles Fillmore and Mortal Fillmore. And this is just beautiful. It's just so powerful. It brings tears to my eyes. And so it was a powerful moment. We were just at the start of this work. Unity was young. We didn't know how far it would go. We didn't know what we would be asked to do. But we had conviction. That was a contract that we made three ways. The first was the contract within each of our souls. I had to make a promise to myself to make every thought, word, and deed be in the spirit of the Christ truth within me. I had to promise to me that this was my work, my purpose. And then my husband and I, together, united, declaring, this is our purpose, our work. And then in the presence of all that is good and holy in the presence of life itself. Knowing that whatever we give comes back to us, pressed down, shaken together and overflowing. We were in contract with the divine. Spirit never moves backward. Always forward. It was our faith that built this ministry it is your faith that continues it, the healing work. So I would invite you, dear one, and all of you dear ones, to make that contract, first within your own soul, to all that is good, holy, to your purpose, and then make that contract with God. Yes, everything that I do, is in partnership. It is not I. It is the Christ within that does the work. Unlimited. Unlimited in divine. And with that, with that, through that, all things are possible. Not probable. Possible. Do you have just that feeling of God working through you in this moment? Absolutely. I do too. I do too. So make your contract and make it holy. And then be awake and aware.
to the miracles that will come to your life. Your life will change course just like mine did that night that I heard I am a child of God, I do not inherit sickness, neither do you. You go forward to meet this day to meet your good. You're on the king's highway and all the lights are green. And that's the truth. And so it is. And so it is. And so we let it be. And so we let it be. Do I hear an amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you, dear one. Thank you, Marta, for being with us. It's my joy here.